Okay, so why would uh, America want to open Japan? First of all, well, the four reasons are here. First of all, trading. Uh, with China being opened up after the Opium War, Japan was a natural stop for people to go to China. You look at America, you sail directly across, right? If you look at America here, and you sail, di America sail directly across the globe, the place you hit is Japan. China was opened up, and the China trading port was opened up in Canton. Canton would be around down here, this area here. Which means that if uh, America was to go all the way to China, it's a very long trip. You can go to Hawaii and then go. But you can also go straight to Tokyo, straight to Japan, and then go along the borders here. Because if you go along the shores, if there's anything, if there's a shipwreck, it's much closer. And there have been occasions of shipwrecks where um, the Japanese, you know, if they had a shipwreck, the Japanese took care of them and sent them back to America. And that was, and that was fine. And so America really saw Japan as kind of a good stop to go to China. So number one, trading with China. And of course, the trade of Japan as well. You get to trade of Japan uh, if you open them up. So China was, but for China was really there, the big thing that they wanted. Number two, growth of whale, of the whale, American whaling activity in uh, the Pacific. The whale industry was huge. Back then, uh, and what what do ale what what do whales uh, produce? I mean, oil, oil. Okay, oil and uh, oil. Pork. A lot of omega three. <laughs> okay. Pet. Meat. Okay, some some meat, but uh, oh, close. So, I think mostly it's for oil, right? For la for lamps and whatnot, and um, and so the whaling activity in the Pacific was huge. And if you remember from your U.S. history class, is manifest destiny. What's manifest destiny? Oh. Yeah. Spread out. Oh, okay. Security. Spread the ideas. Yeah. Well, not security. A, take over a combination of everything. Uh, the the American kind of like the their to see their um kind of like their right for America <coughs> to spread from east to west and take over the the whole land. And essentially, when you take over the land, if you continue heading west, where do you go? Into the in, yeah, you go into the east, the, basically the into Japan, into the ocean, and so that was a major thing. Is the America America want to continue to spread their influence out west? Because America can't spread their influence east. Because if they spread their influence east, who are they going towards? Europe. Yeah, Europe, and Europe's pretty much set. They're from Europe, right? So their only choice was head west. Next thing, California gold rush. A lot uh, in 1849, the gold rush happened. And a lot of once again. A lot of ships had to travel to and from Japan. And last of all, steam navigation. Uh, steam navigation is uh, basically because they can. America can go to Japan. They have the ability to go there safely, no problem, because they have steam power. <clears throat> so what was the change that happened? Well, of course, the Japanese were impressed. Right, the Japanese, you know, can charge at them with, you know, their samurai swords and bows and arrows. Right, it doesn't matter how many samurai axes you have. Um, you guys know, you guys know kenshin. Kimchi. Not, not, not kimchi. <laughs> you guys know kenshin. That samurai. The samurai. Yeah, the samurai with the scar. Yeah, like, like unless you have a couple of those, you know, take out the Americans. But basically, <laughs> there was it was basically Japanese soldiers against cannons, and it wasn't very effective. So, the Japanese were impressed with the gunboat technology, and there was a case precedence. Case precedence means that something has happened before already, and they already saw China. China was totally owned in the Opium Wars. They did not stand a chance against the Western powers. And so, in the case of China, they, uh, they saw what, China, what happened, and that after China lost, they had to sign the unequal treaties. The unequal treaties is basically um, grants the Western, the Westerners, extraterritorialism. Extra like, what the? <laughs> it grants them things such as extraterritorialism. Okay, extraterritorialism, and. Something and that basically means that you know foreigners can step into China, 
So just say if you're a, a, a miguk salam, right, you're, you're an American, you can walk into China, you can go in China and you get, you know, uh, just say you punch someone in China. And you get in a fight in China, you kill someone. According to Chinese law, what happens to you? You're you're, you die. Yeah. According to American law, if you kill someone, what happens to you? Jail. You go to jail. Right. And so here, here you have a situation where not, not I'm not saying the situation is you know Americans are going over to China to kill people, <laughs> but um, where you but you essentially have a lot of Europeans in China fall, doing things that they see as okay to their culture, and then the the Chinese are like uh, no, arrest them, put them in trial, and then the Western power says no 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 you can't put them in trial they're you know European they're American they're French they're British. Um, you have to let them go, and then they are to be tried in their own courts. And if they take the people, go back to their own courts, and of course they, you know, give them a little slap on the wrist and let them go. So even if they go and rob someone, or they go hurt someone, you know, just like slap on the wrist, okay, uh, pay, you know, fifty dollars, pay like ten dollars, and then go. And so a lot of, and this was called the unequal treaties, and not only, uh, not only extraterritorialism, they also had to pay reparations and all these other things and lose territory. For example, Hong Kong was lost in the Opium War. Uh, Hong Kong was signed off to the British in the Opium War. Um, uh, oh, oh my goodness. I'm, I was, I'm thinking Manchuria, but not Manchuria. What's that place? Mukta. No, no, no. The, the place next to Hong Kong. Macau. Macau, right. I was thinking Manchuria. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Macau. Macau was also... Who, who did, who did uh, Macau go to? Does anybody know? Hmm? France. Not They're France. Not Macau? Uh, no. Uh, uh, you know where you go to? No, not Italy. Spain. Spain. No, not Spain. Portugal. British. Pardon? Portugal. Portugal is correct. Oh, Portugal. Yeah. Macau went to Portugal. And so here you have, and, uh, and then uh, French, the French got Indo, Indochina, meaning they got pieces of Vietnam. Um, and so here you have a situation where a, a case pres uh, you have a case precedence of Western powers going to Asia, taking over. And um, and people in uh, China suffering from unequal treaties. And Japan was like, we don't want that. We're not gonna we're not gonna follow what China did. And hence they signed the Treaty of Kanagawa in 1850, 1854, and they gave America what they wanted: trade. You can come by, stop, you know, stop by and do, and do stuff if you want. And um, they basically opened up Japan. Yes. What does case precedent mean? Case precedence means uh, it has happened before. So, for example, if I just say, you guys use case precedents all the time and you don't even know it. For example, if a teacher, uh, just, say on a multiple, just say on a short answer question, I gave uh, Hisu and Jennifer, you both wrote the same thing, and I'm, I'm the teacher and I'm grading, and I grade Jennifer right and I grade yours wrong, but you wrote the same thing. Then there's a case precedence in which, you know, uh, <laughs> Where you're like, hey, but you marked hers right, right? And now I'm like, oh yeah, I marked it right, so I'll give you a mark as well. And so that's the case precedence. And then after a while, you start realizing that, hey, Mr. Tam is willing to change grades all the time. Well, and then therefore, and you'll notice that there are some teachers who are always, who are often willing to change, like you know, if you nag them, the, the teacher will be like, fine, I'll boost you to a B, right? There's some teachers who do that. I love that. Yeah, I know you love those teachers, but uh, and and so therefore, you a lot of you will go and complain to the teachers like, oh, I got a D this time. Can you please bump me to a C? I promise I'll do better next term, right? And 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 you guys know, you guys, and you guys know who those teachers are. Who's it? I don't know who they are, <laughs> but you but you probably talk amongst yourself. You have an idea who it is, and you probably have an idea that you can't do that with me because I don't boost. I mean, it's like <sighs> we'll talk. <laughs> we'll talk, and that's about it. <laughs> we'll just talk. <laughs> and unless you have a really good case, like Michael comes to me and he says, hey, you marked this wrong. I'm like, oh yeah, I did mark it wrong, and of course I'll change it. Zero point five? Not... Pardon? Zero point five? five that was uh, Ryan. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, case precedence means it has happened before, and it's actually a, a term used in law. It's a term used in law. Meiji Restoration. So they decide to modernize, and so the emperor decides to lead modernization, and uh, the emperor leads the modernization, and they the show and they, the shogun, 
uh, who could not deal with uh, the economic problem that uh, the Japan was having at that time, decides to give up his power to the emperor in, in 18, 1867. So, uh, by 1868, the emperor began to lead reforms. The emperor's name is called Meiji. Yongji, right? Yongji, what, what's the whole term? Yongji. Um, okay, it doesn't matter, I forgot. <laughs> Meiji Restoration. And so he changed the government from a, feudalist, a feudal government to a lim, uh, one of a limited democracy. He abolishes the samurai class. And of course, we have seen the movie the, the Last Samurai. Hands up! Oh, oh yeah. isn't that guy like with beard? Tom yeah, Tom Cruise. Yeah, Tom <laughs> Cruise is the Last Samurai. That's basically the time period that they're talking about. The samurai class was being abolished. You have some ex samurais who turn into military officers, and you have some uh, just you know samurai who don't want to give up their samurai status, and they decide to choose to die in, die in glory, or you know they they commit a seppuku to uh, out of shame or they commit the seppuku to tell the emperor, you need to stop this. The samurai class is being destroyed. Um, regardless, the samurai class was abolished. Um, and, then, uh, it, and then they industrialized. Japan brought in a lot of um, technicians from, um, like I said earlier, Japan copied the British Navy. Right? If you're going to copy, uh, if you're going to copy a Navy, copy it from the best. Mm -hmm. The British at that time were the best because they were on an island, and Japan's on an island, and the, Brit the British have just been doing it for a long time. So the Japanese got their navy from the British. For the land army, who had the strongest land army at that time? Germany. 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 The Japanese got their whole military system from Germany. Right? And it's also interesting because because of that, Japan t uh, takes, the mil takes the whole military system of Germany and implements them in into themselves. Uh, and, what, and in Germany, the system is... Who has the highest power? Uh, Hitler. No, no, no. That's before Hitler. Kaiser. Who? Kaiser. The Kaiser. Kaiser has the. Right, the Fuhrer is later on. That's that's World War Two. But uh, we're talking about the 19th century here when uh, Japan was modernizing. Japan takes the system where the Kaiser is the leader. So they take the Kaiser, and then the Kaiser has the Chancellor, and then the Kaiser has direct control over the military. Japan did the same thing. Who controls the military? Yes, no, emperor. the emperor. Does the, the and so the question is: Does the parliament control the Does the parliament control the military? Yeah. No, and that leads and because of the Meiji Constitution, you'll see and that, that'll be actually be your homework. We'll you'll be reading the Meiji Constitution. You'll realize that the government that the government really had no control other than the emperor. No one really had control of the military, and that's why the military was able to do all those things that they did. Um, so they sent the young abroad to get educated. Uh, sent them to Europe. Sent them to America. Get education. America, you know, helped a lot of their modernization process as well by doing business and so on. And uh, last of all, uh, they modernized their army. Where Japan basically they had a, they developed the modern army, which leads to the Sino-Japanese War. I think uh, we're gonna leave it at that for today. Yeah. Okay.